Hey, Icon, good to be with you here today. Uh, I'm recording this the day after the Super Bowl, and uh, it was kind of a boring game. It's a little bit of a bummer, but uh, Tom Brady is amazing, is ridiculous. Uh, and this moment happened in the middle of the game where, you know, they're all talking about how old he is, right? Like, you know, he's so old, he's been in so many games, whatever. And my son, my nine-year-old goes, how old is Tom Brady? And I looked it up and he's 43 and the entire room was like, oh my gosh, he's older than you, dad. And, and I'm, so I'm 42 and, and, and I'm like offended by this, right? Like the, how is that so ridiculous? And my wife goes, no, babe, we're just saying there's still a chance for you. You could win a Super Bowl even at your advanced age, which I felt like was a really great wife thing to say. Uh, I bring that up because today we're talking about eternal life. And I couldn't help but think of that last night with watching Tom Brady, just thinking this dude's tapped into eternal life in, in some form or fashion, it's some crazy diet and exercise regimen. But, but this dude just continues to be the greatest of all time, even at such an advanced age as 43. I don't even know how he's walking, honestly, let alone winning Super Bowl MVPs, but he is. So today we are talking about eternal life. And uh, for those of you watching this, uh, I'm sad to not be with you on Sunday. Uh, we are launching live services on February 14th, uh, but uh, I'm glad you're with us today. Hope for the chance to see you uh, soon. Today, um, we are talking about eternal life, and, and in many ways, this is a very simple, straightforward gospel message, and yet, uh, I think some of the nuance of it, or and, and not only some of the nuance, but actually some of the just big ideas, some of the obvious ideas, get lost in the shuffle of daily life, get lost in the shuffle of all of the challenges that we're facing as a world, and, and they get lost because they're the basics. And there's something in us that wants to always get past the basics, uh, but, but in the process, sometimes we lose what's most important. So let's jump in. Uh, John chapter 6, starting in verse 47, which is where we left off last week. Jesus, again, uses this phrase, truly, truly. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Now, Jesus has been now in this kind of I'm the bread of life conversation for, uh, for the full chapter, right? This is our third sermon in this little dialogue that Jesus is having. And, and earlier, Jesus had started to talk about being the bread of life. And the Jews had said, well, God provided manna in the wilderness for us. And this was a really significant story for them. They're out in the desert. They are, they're, they're, you know, hungry. They don't have food. They don't have provision. God made bread appear out of nowhere, out of the dew uh, each morning. And it was just the story of provision that the Jews really clung to. And Jesus goes, man, that was great. God provided. But those people that he provided for, they're dead. So I get that y'all are really excited about the manna, but the, all those people who ate the manna, they eventually died. They're not here. Any of you here? You're not here. You're dead. Okay. He goes, I'm talking about a bread that gives eternal life, a, a bread that causes you to be able to live forever. And he goes, and I am that bread. Right, so the, the basic, most simple version of the gospel message, of the Christian message is John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Right? This is one of the first verses that every Christian child learns. And it's, a, it's the hope. It's got the kind of core hope that we cling to. And, and yet, in the midst of daily life and the hustle and bustle and the changing cultural context, sometimes we can miss kind of the big E on the I chart. Right? Here's the, the simplicity of what Jesus is saying. If you believe in me, you get to go to heaven. Right? Heaven. Like real heaven. Like we, we believe in heaven, that when we die, those of us who believe in Jesus, who have been with Jesus, who follow Jesus, given our lives to Jesus, that we will live forever 
with God in heaven. That's like, that's the big carrot that's dangled out in front of us to go, man, that's the goal. That's eternal life. And yet, I don't know about you. I, it, the, heaven's not something I think about a lot, right? And it definitely wasn't, when I was growing up, something I thought about a lot. And, until really just a couple of years ago, I read a book called Heaven by Randy Alcorn, which was a total game changer for me and really shifted the way I think about heaven and, and in fact gave me a desire for it that I never had before, right? So I, like maybe some of you, thought of heaven as clouds and harps and kind of this disembodied experience of kind of being a spirit and, you know, fly, kind of flying around. Or I, Actually, as a, as a young kid, like in high school, I pictured heaven as being this huge amphitheater. And, and it was just like an eternal worship service. And for whatever reason, because of me, I was in the back row of the amphitheater looking down on these billions of people and, and like, uh, you know, like a, a band like Mercy Me leading worship for eternity. And I'm like, eh, no, th no thanks, I'm good. Uh, and so I just had no desire for it. It felt like one of those things that was like, like carrots. Like, I know it's good for me, but uh, no thanks, right? And that book fundamentally changed the way I think about heaven, right? It fundamentally changed it. That, that the vision that the, the scriptures give us of heaven is not about harps and disembodied spirits and all of that, but a, a, a very tangible reality that it is much of what we see and experience in our daily lives, but with the sin pulled out of it. Right in, in Hebrews chapter eight and chapter ten, the writer of Hebrews talks about this world as a shadow of what is to come, or a shadow of the true things, which is super interesting because I feel like in many ways that's the reverse of how we think about. It. We feel like this world is like real life and tangible and and tactile, and that heaven's going to be disembodied and ethereal. Where the writer of Hebrews says the exact opposite. And in, in fact, C.S. Lewis in The Great Divorce picks up on this theme in his description of heaven. He says this, he says, it was the light, the grass, the trees that were different, made of some different substance, so much solider than the things in our country, that men were ghosts by comparison. Moved by a sudden thought, I bent down and tried to pluck a daisy which was growing at my feet. The stalk wouldn't break. I tried to twist it, but it wouldn't twist. I tugged till the sweat stood out on my forehead and I had lost most of the skin off my hands. The little flower was hard, not like wood or even like iron, but like diamond. There was a leaf, a young tender beech leaf lying in the grass beside it. I tried to pick the leaf up. My heart almost cracked with the effort and I believe I did just raise it, but I had to let it go at once. It was heavier than a sack of coal. And, and, and I love that vision that Lewis has. And I think it is actually far more biblical that the real world is heaven, that this is just a shadow of what is to come. This is just an inkling. It's just a trailer for the full cinematic experience that is to come. Now, this vision of heaven is tied up in the larger gospel story that we believe, that story of creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. That from Genesis to Revelation, and I know this is going to be review for some of you, but for many of us, this, this is brand new stuff, that the Bible is the story of God. It is the story of God's work in the world, and it begins with his perfect creation. That once he gets done creating all the stuff of the world, he calls it very good. That shortly thereafter, there is rebellion, that there is sin, and the whole world kind of descends into rebellious chaos, and that that is the world that we have experienced until Christ. And when Christ came, this, this hope of redemption broke in, and you, you notice all the words that, that come around Jesus' work start with R-E. It's redemption, it's reconciliation, it's restoration. That Jesus' work is not to do a new thing, but to redo an old thing. So we talk about it as creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. That the end is the restored version of the beginning. 
So if we want to think about what is heaven, we don't go to the end only and see some ethereal thing that seems so distant and, and other. We go to the beginning and see God's intention in creation and go, that's what God's work always was. That's what God always intended it to be. That's how God always intended for us to live. That's the, the life, that's the being that he made us for. Lewis, again, he says, a, a continual looking forward to the eternal world is not, as some modern people think, a form of escapism or wishful thinking, but one of the things a Christian is meant to do. It does not mean that we are to leave the present world as it is. If you read history, you will find that the Christians who did most for the present world were just those who thought most of the next. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this one. Aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you will get neither, right? So there is this very clear sense that Jesus is offering us an eternal life that means life forever with God. This is the promise of verse 47. This is the promise of verse 51. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. But there's more to it than that. And, and this is the great gift of God that he doesn't simply go, hey, I created this world to be perfect and good and I created you uniquely for it. But man, this is broken, so just wait just you wait. It's going to get good down the road. It's going to get good in eternity. He goes, nope, I don't give up on my creation that easily. There is clearly a future sense in which God has offered us eternal life, but notice the verb tense. And I don't usually get all grammatical on you, but you English majors will love this. Notice the verb tense in verse 47. Let me read it again. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. Now, is that a future tense verb? Is that a past tense verb? Or is that a present tense verb? Good, Paolo's nodding yes. That's a present tense verb, okay? That means that those who believe in Jesus have currently eternal life. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean you will live forever now that you will never experience physical death? No, we know that that is not the case. But what's interesting is that many times in the Gospel of John, Jesus uses this present tense verb to talk about eternal life. John 3, 36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. This is about today. John 4, 14, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. John 5, 24, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life has. You, you have already passed from death to life. John 12, 50. I know that his commandment is eternal. What I say, therefore, as the father told me, this is eternal life. John 17, 3. This is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ you have sent. He says, this is what eternal life is, that they know you. That, that they are in relationship with you, that, that they have come to believe in you and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That is what eternal life is, Jesus says. That, that their eternal life is the relationship that we have presently offered to us in Christ. So what might it mean to have eternal life today? John 10.10 10 gives us another phrase to explain it. It says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I, Jesus, came that they may have life and have it abundantly. That this vision of eternal life forever is certainly on the horizon and certainly a, a, a great joy to look forward to, but it doesn't start after you die. Eternal life begins now. 
eternal life doesn't mean that we pine for heaven in a way that ignores today in the process. That the gift of eternal life is something that you have been given today. Lewis, yet again. A continual looking forward to the eternal world is not a form of escapism or wishful thinking, right? We talked about this, that this is not just a way for us to think, gosh, I don't like this world. It's, it's painful and difficult. It, and I just, I want to think about heaven. This is a gift offered to us today. Now, I think for us here in Seattle, this is not our primary problem, right? Our primary problem in Seattle is not that we all think too much about heaven. Now, I, I do think there tends to be a divide, and it um, unfortunately falls along partisan lines often, where there is a, a, a sense in which Christians look at Seattle and kind of respond in two ways. And any kind of look at culture, right? We, one, respond by going, gosh, this is terrible. Get me out of here. And so it, whether it's the suburbs or heaven, we're trying to leave. We're trying to experience a different reality. And I think others who kind of fall off the horse in the other direction, and perhaps I would suggest that this at Icon is more of our temptation, that we look at Seattle and go, okay, let me fit. Let me figure out how to fit my Christianity, how do I fit my faith as a puzzle piece into this Seattle experience, where whether it's the culture, the work, the ambition, the whatever, one of us tries to escape, the others of us try to fit. So I don't think our challenge is that we're not thinking of heaven enough. I think we're, we're thinking too much about earth and giving it far too much value. Now, there is a purposeful tension in this. Because if you remember, two weeks ago, I talked about the yes and right? That Jesus says, yes, your physical needs matter. I'm, I'm aware of, and I care about your physical needs. And there's more. There's a spiritual reality that I care just as much about, if not more. And it's more. Where he goes, I, I would rather you be hungry for a moment and spiritually full than have your belly be full and you be spiritually empty. So Jesus is not deny, he's not calling us to be ascetics. He's not calling us to be monks and to deny our physical body and well-being constantly. He goes, no, I know you need these things. I know you need to eat. I know you need to drink. I know you need clothes and a roof over your head, but there's more. And so when I provide for you, like when I fed the 5,000, that was meant to point to a greater reality that I'm the kind of savior that has the power over the physical world so that instead of thinking, Thinking more about this world, you might think less about it because I've got it under my sovereign care. And that might free you up to be less anxious about the world and more attentive to your spiritual reality. Okay. So what I want to do today is go one step further and say it's a yes and, yes and, yes. Track that? Here's what I mean. Yes, God cares about your physical reality. And he is more concerned about your spiritual reality. And that spiritual reality is not simply about your salvation and your hope of eternal life in heaven. But that third and is, and when we get right eyes to see the world spiritually the way Jesus does, that frees us up to then come back to the physical world and see it differently than we ever have before. So yes, God is attentive to your physical needs. And yes, he cares more about your heart. And yes, when your heart gets right, you begin to see those physical needs and physical challenges differently. The real danger that we face is that we take our eyes off of heaven altogether and we just say yes to the first yes and we never actually make that transition to getting our eyes on Jesus and seeing that he is sovereign over all of the day to day and we begin to just focus on that day to day and all of our energy and our anxiety and our care is on that. We never take our eyes off of that and get it on Jesus so we never get a chance to see the world and those day to day realities the way he sees them. 
Go to verse 57. Sorry, verse 52. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Right? They're taking him very literally. If my son Cole had been alive back then, he'd have been a Pharisee for sure. Right? Like, takes everything super literally and then wants to have an argument about the over literalness that he took, whatever it is you said. Okay? So, this is what they're saying. Jesus goes, Hey, you're talking about man in the wilderness. I am the bread of life. Feed on me, eat me, and you will have life. And the Jews go, Well, I mean, how can he ask us to eat his flesh? That's ridiculous. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, and this, I just, I love Jesus for so many reasons, but one of them is the way he changes the verb he's going to use here. In the beginning, when he talks about eating his flesh, he's just using kind of a benign word. He changes the verb to eat here in verse 53 to a, a word that is like a, a word you would use to describe how an animal eats flesh. It's literally like a gnawing and a tearing and a crunching, right? So, so he's almost saying, truly, truly, it, it, like he, he says, you got you to eat me. And the, the Pharisees are like, well, how can we eat him? And he goes, okay, here, here, here's what I'm going to tell you. Truly, truly, you got you to gotta gnaw on me. You got to munch on me. You got you to gotta tear and crunch my bones and tear at my flesh. Like Jesus just doubling down to make his point to, to show how ridiculously over literal these Jews have been. So truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Now, I, I, I asked Alona to do uh, scripture reading very dramatically and to use like a voice for this part because that's how I picture Jesus doing it. I don't think she's going to do it. But this is how I picture Jesus saying this, just to make his point because the Jews are being so ridiculous, right? Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood, right? Like, not because he's a vampire or something, but because, come on, Jews, like, get your stuff together here, right? But he, he's making the point. And in fact, the Greek word is, is one of those words that just like sounds like what it means. It's something like rar, 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 or something like that, where, where it's literally like, this is just what it would sound like for an animal to eat uh, a carcass. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living father sent me and I live because of the father. So whoever feeds on me, he will also live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not as the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. So Jesus is literally in church being like, y'all got to eat my blood or drink my blood. You got to eat my flesh. You got to crunch my bones. You, it, just to push the Pharisees to the ridiculousness of their argument. Now, what is Jesus's larger point here? His point is in verse 57. As the living father sent me, this is the, this is the theme of the life, right? So the, as the living father sent me and I live because of the father, so whoever feeds on me, he will also live because of me, right? The, the symbolism is clear. We have to go to Jesus to meet our needs. And when we do, we will find eternal life today. The, the flourishing, abundant life, that, that today eternal life that we have when we know God, when we come to Jesus and feed on him, when we come to him for sustenance, when we come to him for every need that we have, we come to Jesus with it. He goes, that is life. Now, that's easy to say. What does that actually look like? I have three examples and, and I, and I want to read them. Okay. So I'm going to read a longish thing that I wrote just to get at some really practical examples of what this might look like in your daily life. The first is a category of provision, the way in which God might provide for you. Um, maybe we need a job. Maybe we've lost ours or maybe we simply need a better one. 
We have choices. We can network, we can scour Indeed and LinkedIn, email everyone we know in the industry to make connections, write cover letters, update our resume for each application, hoping that we will be able to find the job that we need. This, this process is stressful and, and, and gives us anxiety and sometimes out of desperation, we can take a job that we don't actually want, that we know that is a job we won't actually flourish in. The other option, the option that Jesus invites us into is that we begin by praying, asking God to guide and direct our path, to give us insight and opportunities that we wouldn't have found on our own. We ask him for peace that surpasses our understanding, peace that makes no sense, peace that isn't dependent upon the situation itself. And then we do all the things we said above. We network, we scour Indeed and LinkedIn, we email everyone we know in the industry to make connections, we write cover letters, we update our resume for each application, and we hope that we will find the job that we need. And every time we feel stress, every time we worry, every time we have anxiety, instead of doubling down, instead of fighting through, instead of getting another cup of coffee, instead of whatever distraction we might use to take away those feelings we don't want to feel, instead of doing that, we pause. And we pause. Instead of doubling down or working harder, we slow down. We take deep breaths. And we remind ourselves, out loud even, that God is sovereign, that he loves me, that he is for me, and he knows every need I have because he made me. And then I go back to LinkedIn with a new, renewed sense of peace and purpose. Yes, God knows I need a job. And yes, he cares more about my heart than my job. And yes, when my heart is in him, then I pursue that job differently than I would have otherwise. He cares about my physical needs. He cares about my heart. And when I entrust my heart to him purposefully and actively, it changes the way I see the world. Maybe that's not your scenario. Maybe there's another scenario. Imagine this scenario. It's gonna be hard for some of us, but um, imagine a scenario where there is a global pandemic. At the beginning, you spend time watching the news and tracking its spread. It reaches our shores and you pay even closer attention. You are learning everything you can about viruses and how they spread. Somehow you get an honorary AA in virology in the process. You begin to grow anxious about its danger and so you take precautions. You get a mask and start to work from home. You follow all of the governmental instructions to the T and urge others to do the same. You tweet and post on Facebook somewhat passive-aggressively shaming people who aren't as concerned as you are. You don't go out, you keep up on the trends and vote for candidates who, think, who you think have a proper understanding of the issue. You grow increasingly hostile and partisan because you simply cannot understand how people could be so callous about human life. Or every morning you go to God in prayer asking him to protect your body from the virus, but also your mind from lies and your heart from fear. You acknowledge each morning that God is sovereign over all and nothing escapes his mighty hand. You know that the virus is indeed dangerous and that all people should be taking the proper precautions, but every time you begin to spin a tale in your mind about the careless people who don't care about life, you pause and pray. You ask God to calm your mind, to remind you that those other people are just broken humans trying to make their way through life. Instead of mocking or deriding them, you begin to pray for them, while still taking your precautions and urging those you are responsible for to do the same. You begin to believe that, yes, God cares about my safety and my responsibility to keep others safe, and... He cares about my heart and how it is responding to the situation with fear. And that if I can submit my heart's fears to God and remind myself that while the world is indeed scary, nothing is strong enough to overcome God. And as a result, I begin to interact with the world in a way that is life-giving, peaceful, and loving. Imagine one more scenario. 
you are single, but don't really want to be. You've tried dating at work and realized that's a terrible idea. You've met a few people at church or through friends, but nothing really clicked, and then it's just awkward and yet another social space. So you do the unthinkable and download an app. Maybe it's eHarmony or Match at first because they seem safe, but you quickly realize that it's mostly guys who look like your uncle and quickly delete the app. So you download one of the new ones, the ones for the cool kids. You're immediately intimidated and insecure by the whole process, but the swiping is fun and kind of addicting. Occasionally, you picture someone swiping past your profile, but that is far too triggering, so you push it out of your mind quickly. You go on a couple more dates and still no click. There are a couple people that you clearly like more than they like you, which is a terrible feeling, but probably just part of the game. Over the course of a year or so, you download and delete the apps a couple of times as your confidence and desperation ebb and flow. You notice that the filters you once used, serious about their faith or very religious, have changed. Now, open to spirituality is enough. Your geographic range continues to widen, as does your age requirement. All of a sudden, you start seeing uncles again and begin to despair. Perhaps all of this culminates in a six-month relationship that you know isn't going anywhere because the other person doesn't really meet any of your criteria, but they swipe the same direction you did which might be the only thing you have in common. You realize this late on a Friday night and break up, only to start the whole cycle again on Monday. There is another way. You begin each morning in prayer. You make your needs and desires known to God. You ask for specifics. You dream big. You ask God to cause your heart to care about the things that really matter, the things that will actually contribute to a long and happy marriage. You aren't being picky, but you are focusing your internal filters on the right issues. By praying these things out loud or writing them down, you are forced to see exactly what it is that your heart wants. Some of it is good, and you double down. Some of it is embarrassing, and you repent and erase. You download the apps again, but set the filters with conviction. When the insecurity arises in you while swiping, swiping, you stop and pray. You tell God specifically what you are feeling and why, and then maybe you swipe some more, maybe you don't, but you have named to God the desire and the brokenness of your heart, and he meets you there, affirms what is good, convicts you about what is destructive. You begin to feel more content about where you are and hopeful for where you could be in the future because your convictions will not allow you to settle for a relationship that would only bring you more despair. This is what it might look like to feed on Jesus in real life. It's not complicated. It's just the simple process of acknowledging what it is you need or what you're afraid of, what you want, what you desire, and, and taking it to him. As, as simple and almost kind of woo-woo magic or even maybe kind of psychological as that may sound, the simple process of taking your request to God is not only a biblical mandate, but it just works. That when you feel that anxiety, when you feel that, that reaching, right? I, I know for me, my, my issue is about ambition. I want to be somebody and I want other people to see how great I am. That's the monster that is inside of me. This desire to be loved, this desire to be uh, honored, this desire for people to think I'm pretty awesome. That's the monster in me. And it drives so much of what I pursue. It drives so much of my behavior and what I say and how I respond. And in those moments, I, I know the feeling, right? Like if you're at all attuned to your heart, you know the feeling. It's like the early pangs of hunger that I talked about a couple of weeks ago. You know those beginning feelings, those initial rumblings of anxiety or desire or whatever it is, fear. And and if in those moments, instead of feeding the monster or trying to distract it, if we just pause and go to Jesus and go, hey, I... I feel the monster coming up. 
I feel the fear. I feel the anxiety. I feel the desire. I feel the loneliness. I feel the despair. God, I know. And we just say this out loud. That, I mean, there's, there is real magic. I mean, power. In, in just simply saying out loud, praying to God, God, I feel this in me, and, and my, my temptation is to reach for something else, but I want to reach for you. I know you're sovereign, so there's no reason to be afraid. I know you, you love me, so you're, you're going to protect me and provide for me. I, I know you know my need for companionship and relationship, so I know you've got someone for me. And, and for me, I have to, in those moments, go, I, I know who you've made me to be. May, may I not look out here for what you tell me every morning here. And it works. We are, our lives are actually changed by that. When we do that, we begin, we have our eyes on our world. If we can take our eyes off it and look at Jesus, we can then put our eyes back on the world and see it differently than we saw it before. That's the power of feeding on Jesus. That is the hope of eternal life now. But man, it, it is it is a temptation that we have to overcome to not get stuck on the world that we see around us and the way in which we think we can solve it. We have to pull our eyes off of that instead of feeding on other things. We pull our eyes off of it and we see Jesus. One last Lewis quote from The Great Divorce. Milton was right, said my teacher. The choice of every lost soul can be expressed in the words, better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. There is always something they insist on keeping, even at the price of misery. There is always something they prefer to joy, that is, to reality. Ye can see it easily enough in a spoiled child that would sooner miss its play and its supper than its than it was sorry to say sorry and be friends. You call it the sulks, but in adult life, it has a hundred fine names, Achilles' wrath, revenge, and injured merit, and self-respect, and tragic greatness, and proper pride. Pride, and the sense of self, force of choice on God's part and ours. There are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says in the end, thy will be done. All that are in hell choose it. Without that self-choice, there could be no hell. No soul that seriously and constantly desires joy will ever miss it. Those who seek, find. To those who knock, it is opened. Jesus says, you will never find the eternal life you long for, the joy, the peace, the satisfaction, as long as your eyes are here. Pulling your eyes off of here and looking to eternity is not to ignore this. It's to then be able to look back on it with new eyes, the eyes of faith, believing that God is sovereign and he is good and totally reorients the way in which we interact with the world. That's the promise of eternal life. Let's pray. Jesus, we cling to your promise of eternal life. Not only uh, life eternally with you forever in heaven, but the joy and the abundance of life here on earth. May we pull our eyes off of the world around us routinely, daily, moment by moment, hourly. We would pull it every, every time we see ourselves, feel ourselves believing the lies of the world around us, that we would pull ourselves out, place our eyes on you, say the true things we know about you, and then be able to go back to this world, put our eyes back on this world, knowing the truth, having reoriented our minds and hearts to the truth to be able to see this world as it is. Good and broken, and sovereignly ruled by you. And may that give us peace, and joy, and satisfaction, and contentment, all the things that we were made for. We ask these things in your name. Amen.
Now, as always, we're gonna to transition to a time of response. We're gonna do this in a few different ways. The band will come and lead us again to sing, uh, to respond by, by saying true things about God to him. Um, we are gonna have a time of silence uh, here in a moment, a chance to kind of settle our hearts before God, to hear from him. And this is a practice, the, the very practice that I'm talking about today, that we would kind of center ourselves when we feel ourselves getting sucked into the lies of the world, that we would pull ourselves out, have a moment of silence, a moment of reorientation back to what we know is true so we can then go back to our lives. And so we're going to do that like we do every week. Um, we also give during this time because giving is a response to the generosity of God. And so we encourage you to continue to be generous. But this passage is, um, is a, a passage that most theologians and commentators say is the kind of the strongest uh, pro kind of prophetic view of communion and the Lord's Supper that we see in all of John's gospel that we are actually given a very physical, a very tangible. This is what Jesus loves to do. He goes, it's not about the earth, it's about heaven, but it's also about the earth, but not totally about the earth. It's also about heaven, but it's also about the earth. And he, he does this for us all the time. And so he has given us this, this symbol of communion that, that symbolizes his broken body and shed blood, which is very physical and very real, but this is a symbolic reality that we honor with a physical reality. Because for Jesus, these are, not, these are inseparable. We cannot separate the physical from the spiritual realities of life. And so we take communion to celebrate, to remember Christ's sacrifice and what it means for us by taking the bread and drinking the juice or the wine, humbly remembering that it was our sin that caused that sacrifice. But it was that sacrifice that offers us eternal life forever and today. Let's do that together.